Welcome to Fuller Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller here with Dave Fisher. Dave, you're out of Denver, Colorado, right? Yes, sir. And you've been around the industry for many, many years. Decades. Decades. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about where you've been. So I've, uh, I've been on both sides of the fence. I uh, started my career at uh, Danzis, now called DHL, uh, you know, in the freight forwarding community. Um, you when know, was my, that? What, what year was that that you were involved Those in? were in the 90s, early 2000s. Okay. And I managed uh, the Southeast region for the company, Got it. Uh, including uh, small port operations uh, uh, facility down in New Orleans, which was a great time. It was a good time. And then after that, I switched sides. I became an actual shipper uh, working uh, on at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company uh, from 2000 to about 2007, uh, managing about a billion dollars of spend on the procurement side. Um, so. You know, Goodyear had sort of an interesting split between um, procurement activity and actual freight tactical activity, um, sort of a you know check and balance operation. So I managed on the procurement side, and uh, some of the work that we did was mostly in transportation optimization, and that's where I've really focused my entire career is on the optimization of transportation logistics platforms. And you've seen that evolve. I, I remember Danza's, it was Dan, it became Danza's uh, AEI, because right. it was a merger, and then DHL, right. I believe, bought it, or was, how was that? Mid-2000s, DHL purchased Yep, Danza's? that's exactly right. And then they merged it, now it's all DHL global supply chain, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, so you've seen the emergence, I mean, you were there when visibility was in its infancy, where you know companies were likely to have a website that showed location, and now it's evolved to something much more fundamental. What is, where do you see that headed? Well, absolutely. You know, shippers and carriers alike have the exact same problem, which is control and custody of their freight, and uh, that challenge has manifested itself in a variety of ways, from a technical aspect, in terms of. You know, how accurate is the data? How timely is the data? How well is the data aggregated so that you can do something with the metrics themselves? You know, what is my total on time delivery? What is my reject rate? Uh, what, you know, what is my freight density by region? All of these KPIs are really fundamentally speaking to the same thing, which is how do I optimize my platform? How do I look out for and forecast for problems in my supply chain? And how do I avoid those problems before they occur? Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, in the world of transportation and logistics, we've gone from an environment where we have dozens and dozens of logisticians, you know, calling for spot rates and calling for where's my freight, et cetera, to moving to a platform finally where we can actually go online and see where our freight is, see where the problems are occurring. And you think that's a trend that, when do you think was sort of started that? Where would you say was the big bang of, of these platform businesses? I think it's organic. You know, the, the desire has always been there for both carrier and shipper. The desire has always been there to, uh, you know, show what's happening, what's going on with our platform at any given time. I think what's changing, Craig, is that the technology is getting so much better now. And the, that technology being aggregatable is, is now the fundamental shift, the paradigm shift that's really changing our industry. Do you think shippers are uh, moving or forcing carriers to adopt this? Or do you think the carriers are doing it themselves? Or do you think everybody's thinking about how do they gain an edge and it's sort of all happening together? It's not mutually exclusive. You know, everybody <laughs> gains by an optimized platform. You know, at any given moment, we have 20 to 27 percent open capacity in North America uh, from a domestic trucking standpoint. That 20 to 27 percent of inefficiency is money, and that 20 to 27 percent of open capacity is opportunity. Mm -hmm. And as we develop our technology and as we get better at optimizing our platform, that money is money that gets saved on both the carrier side and on the shipper side. So it's to everybody's benefit to sort of talk the same language and focus in on what's best for, for us as a, as, a, as a country and as a globe on reducing our carbon footprint and optimizing our rates. 
Yeah, what do you think this ends up eventually? I mean, if you, if you have this idea towards visibility, transparency, centralized platforms, we've seen companies like Uber Freight come out, these digital brokers, sort of this movement in there, other platforms that are out there that are moving towards, you know, everything sort of handled from cradle to grave inside the platform. Mm -hmm. Does this end up in a world where we have a dozen companies that control the world's freight, or do you think it's going to maintain the fragmentation? It is happening fast, isn't it? You know, the whole industry knows that these opportunities exist, and there are quite a few companies that are, and, uh, and data sufficiency companies that are in that business, but they're, they're also seeing the opportunity. I suspect where it will end up is where it ends up in a lot of uh, capitalist environments where consolidation is the necessary thing. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we know that the data is out there. We know that the data is organic and can be unified. It's now a matter of whether or not uh, big data companies can really aggregate that data and, and do smart analytics with it in a way that's m capitalizable, monetized. So when you look at the investments uh, that have been made and you look at, and you were in the role of buying services, technology services, like Goodyear or, or in other roles, what is it when somebody brings a piece of technology? I mean, these are big companies, have a lot of inertia, a lot of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that's for good reason, because you don't want to buy risky technologies, but you're talking about moving supply chain data into a startup or a company that's unproven. How does a, how does a company make that leap to gain your trust? I think the proof is in the data. If a company is advertising or marketing itself as a as a data aggregator, data analytics projector, they should be able to tell you about what you already should know, right? If I have KPIs and you come and tell me that uh, I have a way of projecting your data in a new and, and different way, okay, well then show me your data that matches my data. And therefore, it's self-evident, right? That's the beauty. That's you want to be able to benchmark and back test, or back test your data against their data. That's the beauty of data, is the accuracy of it is self-evident. Mm -hmm. But in terms of companies that are doing matching and execution, have you, have you throughout your career, have you, have you gone with some of the earlier stage uh, unproven, if you will, some will argue unproven, or so others will argue disruptive platforms? Yeah, I've, I've been a, I've taken advantage of, and have been an early adopter to quite a few technologies. Uh, you know, freight bids, electronic freight bids, optimized freight bids, uh, was something that really got its footing in the early 2000s. Uh, Goodyear took advantage of that, we optimized our ocean platform, which up until that moment had been negotiated on a per region basis. Mm -hmm. And there were regions that were using the same carrier at different rates. It was, uh, it seems absurd now, but that kind of visibility didn't exist even 20 years ago. And now that technology does exist. And so people are of course using it to their advantage. Um, and again, that helps the shipper and it helps the carrier at the same time. Uh, you know, I feel like, you know, where the industry has to go organically is towards this idea of um, changing the relationship, the fundamental relationship between carrier and shipper so that, so that both parties are talking the same language about responsible fill levels. You know, if we are all working together, shippers and carriers together, then the, the dynamics of, uh, of rate and exchange gets more efficient. Yeah, I, I wonder, five years from now, where does this end up? Where do we, your guess on, where do you think the industry evolves to um, as it relates to supply chain visibility and transparency? I think that's hard to answer right now. You know, the, the technology 20 years ago, as it emerged, it seemed to indicate that, you know, direct relationships between shippers and carriers was 
going to happen <laughs> any moment now, right? right? And it seemed to go the opposite. And, where and the yet intermediaries there seems, actually there's quite a bit are far more important than they've ever been. Yes, and, and the it's, share is far it, bigger. It was counterintuitive. 20 years ago, but now that's manifest, right? You know, I think history, if history were to write a story, would probably suggest that the intermediaries, because they're not tied to assets, have are far more malleable. They, they're, 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 I've always called them the day traders of the industry. Mm -hmm. They're effectively, whether it's trading data, they're trading information, mm -hmm. and, and their success depends on their take rates, which is how efficient, it's arbitrage, mm -hmm. and so for them, they're not tied to doing business based on how specific assets perform, unlike the carriers are. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have the ability to sort of evolve and be, and they have to bring value. Like ultimately, the real reason that they're adopting a lot of these technologies and sort of the early stage adopters is because ultimately they have to bring value to a shipper. Well, you said it earlier before, how, do, how does a partner like that gain the trust of a new client or potential client or an existing client even. Mm -hmm. You know, to your point, it has to be value creation. It has to be value add activity. And for shippers, that is a very straightforward thing. Where is my risk? How well am I doing? And what is the price that I'm paying in the marketplace versus my competition or my peers in the industry? If you can tell me those things, you're creating value. And if you're filling the gaps of where I am at risk of not being able to get a, a load moved from point A to point B, then you're creating that value. So in a market where, and we've, you and I talked before we were on air about this theory that there, there are participants in the market that don't believe the market's commoditized. They think that really it's not a commodity. and then. You know, I will argue, and I think you and I have sh shared this earlier, is that the market is in many ways commoditized. It's going to become increasingly more commoditized as transparency comes to, play, to bear, mm -hmm. regardless of where it comes from. I'm wondering how to, how does, what does this all end up in terms of how do carriers work with shippers where those shipper relationships are far more transactional? Yeah. And how do shippers maintain the consistency of service where the carriers are dropping in and out of their networks. It might be a little provocative or controversial to talk about, but it is probably the state of the future, right? Eventually, transportation rates are going to be openly traded like cotton or, or gold. We, we would agree with that. Uh, we, we launched a futures contract earlier this year based on trucking, so. And you know, if we, if we sort of meet the conflict at hand, it's this idea that somehow rates should be different between different points. Okay, that's based on supply and demand, isn't it? So why would it behave any different than any other commodity mm -hmm. or service or good that's traded? And Right now in the industry, there are thousands of people whose job it is every day to go out and offer rates and buy rates and trade rates, et cetera, et cetera. And what if that was a little bit different? What if instead of haggling over those rates, it was more efficient and people could move directly to tendering with a known rate across the board? Mm -hmm. Does that help or hurt the industry? What that does is it creates an environment where truckers don't have to be concerned about whether or not their operating costs are gonna be covered and they're gonna be profitable. So long as they can hedge it or de-risk it, the offset. The issue is in a market where you have fluid change in buy and sell, the issue is you have to, you don't have the predictability in rates. And I think the carriers want, that's why they want contract business. They want everything consistent so they don't have the cash flow fluctuations and inconsistencies. Because they need visibility about what the shippers are shipping. Well, the, and, and that's what the market is going to be doing. And they all, but they also, they have a fixed cost. And, and most of the cost in trucking is fixed. There's a large variable component, but ultimately, even though carriers pay on a per mile basis, 
there's still a lot of fixed costs in that driver's salary. They have to guarantee or provide the ability for the driver to get X number of dollars per day or that driver's gonna leave them. They have the truck that's fixed. A lot of their cost, you know, most of the fuel differential is being passed off in fuel surcharges. That's why the, new, the coming data sufficiency model is going to be so valuable for both parties. Because the thing that the carriers really need to know is what are you going to ship and when are you going to ship it? And what is the volume of that? And if they can start to pull that business through, now it becomes organic where they know that their freight is going to be X. They can start to forecast their operations against that and they can fill their empty trucks with the freight at the right time. How do they deal with the situation where if most freight's tendered with a very short cycle, a couple days out, yet they have assets that are geographically dispersed and the, the, the freight's inconsistently tendered, because that's really the way it works, regardless of what mm -hmm. they want to believe or what shippers tell them in terms of consistency. Mm -hmm. Getting them on the same data platform, the same platform, doesn't solve for those inconsistencies in supply and demand. How to, how to, in your view, how do carriers solve for that in terms of consistent utilization and improving that? In my mind, because, because the vast majority of freight decisions and tenderings occur within a 48 hour period of the actual shipment time, the, the visibility and data sufficiency if all my carriers are attached to the same network, where their trucks are becomes organic. Now I know that that particular truck is nearest to this particular origin spot. That's efficient for me and that's efficient for you as a carrier. Yes, granted there's a little bit of random effect there and no carrier in the country is everywhere all at once. Do you think carriers will want to share their locations with their competitors in, in, in the marketplace or? I think it's essential that carriers participate in a neutral network, uh, a, a, a third party, if you will, that can support that platform without having a, a stake in the game, if you will. If they're providing that as a platform, as a basis where the free flow of exchange can happen, where you do not know who the carrier is, and you do not know who the shipper is, as long as everyone knows that it's a level playing field, then we can really talk about how to optimize. And now we're operating in models that we're starting to see emerge, as you said earlier. I think in terms of you know, who has the secret sauce, I don't know that we've actually seen that one company emerge yet. Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of investment dollars a lot of companies fighting for space, um, and a lot of stuff happening. There's a, a lot of noise, a lot of, uh, uh, it's an exciting time, frankly. I mean, it's, as you, you, you've been in this business uh, uh, as long as I have. I, I grew up probably uh, in the back of a truck, not in the back of a truck, I, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but, but I've been in it, and so we've seen sort of the same evolutions uh, at different sort of purviews. But, Dave, I really appreciate you coming on. I look forward to seeing you at Freightways Live. Looking forward to it. So November 12th and 13th, if you haven't got tickets, get them as soon as possible. They go up on October 15th. Look forward to seeing you there. It will be the freight party of the year. Dive into deep conversations on the future of technology, conversations like we've had today, as well as market impacts into 2020 and beyond. We'll see you there. Coming at you live this November in Chicago, Freight Waves is debuting the next chapter of the world's most advanced freight market dashboard, Sonar 5.0. Sonar 5.0 will bring a fresh new look, more amazing insights, and additional weapons to give users the clearest vision yet into freight movements around them. New customization tools allow for better analysis of the individual operations. An alert system will ensure you don't miss those big events that can impact your bottom line. More context, more insights, more power. As an added bonus for attending Freight Waves Live, we're offering Sonar Summits, the perfect opportunity to become a freight market expert. Users will be able to navigate the constantly changing freight markets like never before. Join us at a Sonar Summit at Freight Waves Live this November 12th and 13th in Chicago.